following program on Other Than a 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Once you say one true thing and stick with it, all kinds of other true things occur to you. The truth is contagious. Lying is, but the truth is as well. And the second you decide to tell the truth about something, you are filled with this, I don't want to get supernatural on you, but you are filled with this power from somewhere else. Try it. Tell the truth about something. You feel it every day. The more you tell the truth, the stronger you become. That's completely real. It's measurable in the way that you feel. And of course, the opposite is also true. The more you lie, the weaker and more terrified you become. We all know that feeling. You lie about something and all of a sudden you're a prisoner of that lie. You are diminished by it. You are weak and afraid. The American agenda and democracy, sovereignty and prosperity. Vima writes a book, Karan Naguda gets blacklisted and Julie cries foul. Say what? Well, those are the events of last week. And we are told by our trusted Colombo liberals that all of them are coincidences while their slave brain works 24-7 to defend their Western masters. On the other hand, the IMF has fully seeped its venomous teeth into Sri Lankan affairs, where the middle-income class seems to be paying the price. For insights and analysis, tonight I will speak to the General Secretary of Public Services International, Rosa Pavanelli, former Minister Vimal Viravansa, Senior Lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Dr. Ahilan Kadragamar, the Head of Operation People New Zealand, Chantal Baker, and Scientist and ex SAS Officer and also from Operation People, Phil Shaw. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. And a warm welcome to the State of the Nation. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. A lot to sort out as always, so let's get right to it. Well, as we approach probably one of the most important days in Sri Lanka's calendar, which is uh, May 18th, the day our heroic military defeated the ruthless terrorist, the LTTE, the United States of America has decided to blacklist one of our war heroes, current Northern uh, Province Governor and former Naval Commander, Admiral of the Fleet, Vasanta Karanagoda. This would mean he and his wife would not be allowed to enter the United States. I don't know why anyone uh, would choose to go to that hellhole called the United States, more like the United States of delusional wokeness. That, what exactly are those so-called serious and credible human rights violations that the State Department is referring to? And ludicrous enough, the press statement by the State Department cites independent investigations and documentations by NGOs for their conclusions. We may have a government uh, that has decided to dance to the tune of the IMF that are clearly carrying out the US's agenda. However, you better be aware that this country is still full of people that will not stay silent while their decorated war heroes are being trodden on. The people of Sri Lanka needs to wake up as we will discover within tonight's program the grand scheme of the Western overlords is at play and stench of their action pops out at various corners and this is one of them. If this is the modus operandi of the West, we will do what we want and you better comply, then I think Sri Lanka needs to change some of its decisions immediately. The reason why you and I are capable of going home to a safe space in a country free of terrorism is because people like Admiral of the Fleet Vasanta Karanagoda, along with our heroic military, gave their all to save this motherland. 
I understand that doesn't mean a thing specially to the hoity-toity idiot class of the Colombo liberals. Still, if anyone believes that the sovereignty of Sri Lanka lies elsewhere, apart from the people of our country, they need to be reminded of the reality. If the government doesn't do the needful to address this bullying, they must be reminded to whom the accountability should lie with. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. With the IMF uh, 17th program in full swing in Sri Lanka, we see many warning signs indicating that tough times are ahead for this country. Even though the government was very swift to project to the people that no sooner we are in the IMF program, then all our problems are sorted. Unfortunately, the reality is far from it. We as a nation are yet to start our debt restructuring talks with our creditors, local and overseas. There's a possibility that those talks might fail and hence we might be in a tough spot in the future. The government recently said that the debt restructuring presentation to India and the Paris Club would be done uh, together later in May, while China will be dealt separately. However, what we need to know is that nothing is guaranteed as yet. On top of that, a report from Bloomberg recently stated that Sri Lanka risks IMF roadblock as local debt plan gets few takers. In translation, local creditors are not interested in restructuring the local debt. According to Bloomberg, some of Sri Lanka's biggest lenders, including Commercial Bank and Hatton National Bank, warned that a local debt restructuring would lead to capital impairment as banks are forced to set aside more money to cover losses. To talk more on this and uh, get uh, more clarity, joining me now is a political economist and senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Dr. Ahilan Kadragamar, who joins me via Zoom from Jaffna. Thank you very much, doctor, for your time. Doctor, now, Bloomberg says that the second installment which we are supposed to get from the IMF is in jeopardy due to the local debt restructuring issue. What does this mean exactly? Mahesh, now, when we signed the uh, IMF uh, agreement, um, the IMF had two major conditions even leading up to the agreement. One, that Sri Lanka should have a primary budget surplus by 2024. That means our revenues should be higher than our expenditure. And second, that we have to move forward on debt restructuring with a variety of creditors. Um, that's bilateral donors like China, Japan, and India. Um, but more difficult are the uh, bondholders because almost 53% of our external debt is commercial borrowing from bondholders. Now, the bondholders are playing hardball with us and they are saying that if they are to restructure their debt, Sri Lanka's own domestic debt, particularly treasury bills and treasury bonds should also be restructured. But that's going to be very difficult because when you restructure treasury bills and bonds, it could cause a domestic banking crisis, or it could end up uh, greatly reducing, for example, uh, employees' provident fund. A lot of that is holding these treasury bonds. So this is uh, the problem that Sri Lanka is now caught in because the IMF is demanding that Sri Lanka show that it is moving forward on uh, debt restructuring. The bondholders want us to restructure our domestic debt, but that can lead to a severe crisis or undermine uh, working people's retirement funds. Doctor, what are we to expect if uh, we cannot restructure the local debt? Now, Mahesh, this debt restructuring process was anyway going to be very difficult. 
um, some of our economists and um, international actors, you know, put it forward like a piece of cake, but it's not. In many countries, debt restructuring has dragged on for years because creditors don't like to give a haircut. They want to squeeze out as much as they can. And for Sri Lanka to be on a sustainable path, we have to reduce our debt through either debt restructuring or some economists would even say through debt cancellation. So we cannot give in on certain things. I think the problem with the way in which our government, our policymakers have approached both the IMF and the debt restructuring process is basically they have surrendered. They have not even tried to negotiate. They have in the process lost all bargaining power, but even at this late stage, we have to maintain our position that economic stability, the welfare of our people, is of primacy. There's no point getting an IMF agreement or going through debt restructuring if people are going to starve tomorrow, if our economy completely collapses. It's already collapsed. Last year, economic growth contracted by 7.8%. The last two quarters, the economy is contracting anywhere between 13 and 9%. So we really have to push back and we'll have to uh, stumble along, but we cannot give in on issues like domestic debt restructuring. Uh, indeed, uh, Doctor. Now, most of the nationalist economists said that things would get bad with the IMF deal. But if you take uh, as to how things are right now, the rupee seems to be strengthening against the dollar. The economy is stable. Supply chains are on track, and things seems to be back to normal. So, did those economies? Get it wrong. Um, I, first of all, I think we have to be clear, you know, uh, who these economists are, because in Sri Lanka, as in many countries, there's a wide spectrum of economists. Um, some of them I would categorize as neoliberal or uh, the Chicago School or neoclassical economists. Uh, others, um, it's not clear where they are coming from ideologically. Because the truth of the matter is, over the last 14 years, even when the Rajapaksa regime was in power, they were the ones who first started floating sovereign bonds way back in 2007. While they spoke of sovereignty, they actually sold our sovereignty with sovereign bonds. So many, I would call nationalist economists, were with the Rajapaksa regime all along, even as they went on the neoliberal path. Now, there are some economists move from a left perspective who have been critical of the IMF approach. And there, I would argue that what we are seeing now is not stability, because if you look at the headline figures, fuel consumption is down by 50%. The amount of cement consumed has now dropped by 53%. So our economy has completely collapsed. So to claim that we are being stable when unemployment is on the rise. Even the World Bank says 500,000 jobs have been lost. So in that kind of a context, um, just claiming that our uh, rupee is stabilizing does not mean much. It's come at huge cost and we have to change the economic trajectory. Indeed, uh, Doctor, even most economists are just changing their allegiance whenever they find it beneficial to them. Thank you very much. We have to leave it at that. That was political economist and senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Dr. Ahilan Kadiragama. A short break now. When we return, is it fair to ask Sri Lanka's middle income class to foot the economic recovery bill? This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.
Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now most in the middle income class in this nation are finding it difficult to get on with their day-to-day -day lives due to the high taxes imposed as per the recommendations by the IMF. The question we need to ask is whether is it fair to ask the middle income class of this country to foot the economic recovery bill. After all, they are not the ones who made erroneous economic policies in this nation in the past 75 years. So the leaders of our country still continues to enjoy the luxurious lifestyle that comes with their positions. But you and I are asked to cough up the money that we don't have in order to pay for the mistakes they made. Tax revenue increased 56% from 370 billion rupees to 578 billion rupees in the first quarter of this year, clearly showing how the government is squeezing the middle income class to create a budget surplus, which they actually achieved uh, for March of 2023. The increase came partly from tax hikes and partly from inflation. The total was slightly below um, the 650 billion rupees projected in the IMF program. Joining me now via Zoom all the way from Paris, France, is the General Secretary of Public Services International, Rosa Pavanelli. Public Services International is a global union federation of workers in um, the public services sector. It has been in operation since 1907 and is working with trade unions in over 154 countries. Ms. Pavanelli, thank you very much for taking the time to, um, to speak to us. Really appreciate it. Now, Sri Lanka has got into a program with the IMF, which you already know, and they are requesting high taxes to cover the budget deficit. Now, they are not taxing the rich, they are taxing the middle income class of this country. It has adverse effect as of now. What exactly, uh, Ms. Pavanelli, is your view on this? Should the working class pay the price for the erroneous policies implemented by the government and more so help the rich? Thank you, Mahish, for your questions and for your invitation. Uh, PSI, along with its affiliates around the world, has been fighting for many, many years for tax justice. That means exactly taxing the rich and taxing uh, multinational corporates. Uh, we propose a tax, uh, a global minimum tax at 25%. And uh, this what should be everywhere in the world, particularly in a situation of crisis such as this one of, uh, of uh, Sri Lanka. We think that the, it's time to tax the rich, uh, to stop the illicit flow out of the country uh, that has been ongoing uh, for many years uh, and uh, introduced a progressive taxation that uh, cannot put all the burden on, uh, on workers. But there's also the need to restructure uh, the debt, the, the debt of the country. And this is something very much needed in a crisis such as this one that uh, Sri Lanka is uh, ongoing. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Pavanelli, as you clearly mentioned, this issue where the working class is getting uh, pressured is happening worldwide. This is the trend, uh, if you look at uh, what's happening in France and the UK, this situation is similar. Uh, what is your advice to the working class who's getting used by the wealthy uh, parties left, right and centre? Well, there are different situations there. Uh, because while in France uh, the issue is uh, the reform of the pension system, uh, in England it can be considered similar because it's an attack uh, on uh, public services from one hand and an attack on the right to strike, exactly as it happened already in Sri Lanka. So altogether an attack on workers' rights and people's rights, because when you reduce, you cut public services, you cut fundamental rights, human rights for people. Uh, this is the result of uh, a neoliberal policies that has been ongoing globally for decades, and it's coming now at the very point of a breakout because uh, uh, after the pandemic, the economic crisis, the energy crisis and the climate crisis that we are all in are multiplying uh, the impact 
of uh, neoliberal policies on working people and in particular uh, on public services. And this is uh, something uh, that we are trying to counter with proposals uh, that aim to uh, invest more in public services, invest in green jobs, invest in services that can ensure a human right and lift po uh, people out of poverty according to the SDG uh, programs of the United Nations. Absolutely, neoliberal policies don't work for the working class worldwide. That was uh, on point. Uh, Ms. Mavanelli, finally, in Sri Lanka's case, what do you think the working class should be doing right now? After all, we are in the thickened uh, economic crisis. Many are saying that issues might pop up as we move along. So what should the working class be doing right now? Well, I think that uh, the uh, protests uh, that uh, we saw in the past uh, in the past weeks in Sri Lanka are something that is very much needed, not only because government has to hear the voice of workers, but also public opinion and internationally uh, they should be heard. I think that we can help them uh, uh, for the part uh, of the work uh, of the activities that refer to to the cancellation of the right to strike uh, in the in the country uh, with the international organizations such as the ILO but I also think that they need to be consistent with the global policies of the trade union movement calling for tax justice calling for uh, reduction or cancellation of the of debt, uh, and when I talk about cancellation or restructuring of the debt, I mean uh, by the private uh, uh, lenders uh, as well as uh, the financial institutions, as it has been uh, called also by eminent economists uh, such as uh, Jayati Ghosh, uh, Thomas Piketty. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Domokwam uh, uh, Sundaram and Yanis Varoufakis, who was Minister of Finance when Greece was about uh, to, uh, to, on the verge of a bankruptcy, as well as it happens in, uh, in Sri Lanka. So we think that these are the key issues, uh, the key uh, claims uh, that had uh, to be advanced by the working class at global level, at, uh, uh, at a national level. And of course, there's a responsibility of government that cannot be hidden. Absolutely. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the uh, General Secretary of the Public Services International, Rosa Pavanelli. Thank you. Now, a short break now when we return. The American agenda. Was the US ambassador the ringleader of last year's Aragalia? Stick around. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. State of the Nation. Last week, former Minister Vima Veeravansa launched a book titled Nine, The Hidden Story, basically an expose of what really happened behind the scenes of the now infamous Aragale. The former minister made several allegations after investigating and diving deep into what happened. From the get-go, it was evident that the so-called Colombo liberal idiot class led Aragale displayed at Golf Ace Green was a coup led by certain agendas against this country. The people who ran the Aragale operation uh, hijacked the real pain of Sri Lankans and used it to launch their nefarious, nefarious agendas. Even I asked the question, can a beach party solve the dollar crisis? To which the Colombo liberal idiot class took offense and made a big ruckus because they knew they were getting exposed. 
One thing you need to know by now is that if it's loud on social media, then it's utter bull served by the Colombo liberal idiot class as they have the power, the money and the ability to waste time and create the trends on social media. Why? Because they are filthy rich. The truth is this economic crisis doesn't bother them. They have the time and money to spend creating that BS, which is why you and I need to be very careful in believing in what you see on social media as the ultimate truth. So what does this book from uh, former minister Vima Virwansen tell? Joining me now from the data board is Daniel Vithara That is good to see you once again. Um, I know that you actually went through the book and read the whole book. Uh, what do you find that's alarming and quite revealing? Right. Uh, so Mahesh, within the book, I think a lot of doubt and a lot of speculation has been given out by the former minister pertaining to what happened within the Aragale. And there are certain specific things that he really uh, d dives deeper into also. I want to really cover three uh, particular angles, uh, four particular angles when it comes to this book. Now, there were a lot of content that we passed. Some of them were hearsay. I don't want to focus on that, but focus on the real data that the minister, uh, that the former minister had really put out. He starts off and within the entire segment, within the entire book, gives a bit of a breakdown of the timeline of this Aragale because not a lot of people are aware. Because a lot of people believe that the entire aggression started on May, uh, on, on the 9th of May. But, it was but actually it was not the 9th of May, exactly. Uh, after the 31st, where, when the former president Gota Virajapaksa's house was damaged, 2nd of April and the 4th of April, there were ministers' houses, uh, uh, their officers being damaged, and also the one key incident was the Morto mayor's house being damaged. Yeah. That was, he was pelted and everything. Not not being discussed much. So this was, and the minister... Because that was uh, considered to be the the thing that should be done by yeah. the Colombo liberals. Interestingly, Mahesh, this, uh, the mini foreign minister also points this out, it was called Adre Aragale, as in the Aragale of of, of love, I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, I, that, that's they, how it they started. They roses <laughs> to the military. Yeah. There was that whole tamasha. Uh, the second point, Mahesh, on the Maidan revolution that is in Ukraine, uh, you have covered this extensively. I'm not going to go into details, yeah. but you know that uh, Viktor Yanukovych was outside. Almost similar, almost the exact same thing happened within Sri Lanka with the same kind of material, with the same individuals also, Victoria Newland coming into play, and even their US ambassador, which was Jeffrey Pyatt. We covered that, I don't want to go into too much details. Now, the role of the US ambassador, which is why, what I think is the key mm. portion within this entire thing, not only because I'm saying it, Mahesh, but even the ambassador herself found it a requirement to say that this book is a fiction, and she went on Twitter to say this. Now, the reason why she does this is two key things that have been mentioned within the book. One is my I think you are aware of this famous story where the ambassador, Julie Chang, US ambassador, went to the president and worshipped on his behalf, which is a story that uh, the minister has also mentioned. So is that the it one is for the betterment. They had dinner and uh, apparently um, the ambassador said that I want to pray for the president. Exactly, exactly. That entire story is given within the book. And secondly, something more interesting and something more damaging is the fact that the ambassador has apparently gone and told the speaker to take over in complete violation of our constitution of the country and thereby create what the foreign minister says is a condition like Libya or Iraq within Sri Lanka. Now, we can't say that that is completely unfathomable or far-fetched because we have seen this happen in those very same countries. A last point, Mahesh, is the recommendations by the Karanagara Committee. Now, we have tried to bring this out to light. We have tried to really work on it. The Karanagara Committee primarily focuses on uh, looking at why there was a lapse of judgment by the leadership in the army. We see that there are a, a number of instances where they see that information had gone, that intelligence had gone, but a certain action wasn't taken. Now, to get a clarification of all of this, Mahesh, we spoke to the former minister himself to get an idea of what exactly happened and why this specific uh, book was launched. That was actually the first question we asked the, from, from the former minister. We'll see, we'll take a look at as to what he said. Then me, we are going to argue plan A can be other me Lanka with Divayani plan B. It should be noted that what we are witnessing right now is not the plan A of the so-called Aragalea, but the plan B. We are not facing the initial objective of the Aragalea, which is plan A, but rather plan B. I'm not trying to say that plan B is less harmful, but plan A was to convert Sri Lanka to a situation like what is present in Libya. If that had happened, we would not be experiencing the current results of the Aragalea, but rather we would be living in a society which is a more fearful, murderous hunting ground. The plan A didn't work, especially because of the responsible way in which the Speaker of the Parliament had acted. 
but Plan B is now in action. Now under Plan B, we are becoming a US colony. There is an effort to introduce the Indian rupee as a currency here in Sri Lanka. This is happening under Plan B. There are no Argalists to stop Plan B from happening. None of those heroes are there. This should be understood. What came as the Argale is a color revolution. There have been many color revolutions in many countries across the world in the past few years. To break the political strength of Middle Eastern countries, color revolutions were brought, rainbow revolutions were brought. These revolutions contributed to the fall of countries like Libya. The USA knows that using the youth, social media activists, bloggers, a color revolution can be created. They know this from experience. That is what happened. Now, if we don't do a deep reading of this situation even after an year, there are probably no fools like us in the world. Secondly, Mahesh, we asked the minister what exactly is the key takeaway, what we should really take out from this book. Now, why is the U.S. ambassador in Colombo, within 24 hours of releasing this book, is agitated to the level of sending out a Twitter message? Normally, should you get that agitated for a book? She is getting agitated because she knows what's in this book is the truth. That is why she is trying to discredit the book in front of society via a Twitter message. Let's at least learn from this. When you fall into a pit, there must be at least some benefit for the head. If we can't find any benefit even for the head, we haven't learned anything from the fall. What I'm saying is that let's learn from this. Let's widen our political knowledge. Let's become people who look at the future with caution and care. Maish, that was the former minister explaining exactly why this content was pushed out there and told to the people. A lot of focus needs to be given to the events and the things that have been mentioned within this book. Very interesting, very interesting because, um, I mean, it's always something that we keep uh, telling our viewers is that don't believe every single thing on its face value. Do your own research. Right. Now the former minister has written a book and he, he says these things happened and we have to be very um, understanding of uh, what is going on in our country. We can't be fools. Uh, we can't be the tadpoles in a pond and then expect everything to be okay. A lot of nefarious agendas are at play and this is uh, one of those instances where it has come to light. Thank you very much Dhanadvitanavasam as always. Now, there's a way to find out whether something is true, a lie, or is there something more to it by analyzing what the accused say when the allegations are leveled against them. If it's true, then usually they react trying to dismiss the allegation, not with facts, but with slander. Just uh, like we spoke uh, earlier on, no sooner the book was released, US Ambassador Julie Chung took to Twitter to dismiss the book didn't give any facts as to why the allegations were wrong. One key thing the book accuses is the U.S. ambassador's attempt to create an interim government uh, during the Aragalia by pressuring the speaker to take control, to which, thank God, the speaker refused and stood by and upheld the constitution. We all know how the U.S. Am ambassador Julie Chang acted during last year's unrest, how she met with so-called media influencers and tried to change the narrative online. We also saw news reports of the ambassador calling on the former president countless times in the guise of trying to solve the problem. But rumors were swirling in this country that she was asking him how, to, how he should uh, basically operate at that time and later asking him to step down. Crying foul on the lack of accountability in this country was a tremendous hit with the Aragalia people. So why don't we start that accountability with people who, destroy, who was destroying this country from behind the scenes to make sure that their, um, that their own country gains the best deal out of a misery of 22 million people. By all means, Sri Lankan leaders should be held accountable, uh, especially the ones who allowed this in, uh, interference to continue during their reign. But looking back at things, it looks like some leaders got what they deserve. However, it's encouraging to know that uh, the current president managed to tell the U.S. ambassador to stay in her lane and not interfere with our internal affairs, at least something I hope 
the president will continue to do with all elements interfering with our sovereignty. Short break now, be right back. This is the State of the Nation. state of the nation. Whenever this country goes through hardship, there is always a group of people who claim to be progressive and liberal telling us how we should be fixing the problem according to their solutions, only to find out later that their real intention is to use the situation that all of us are in and make a quick buck for themselves, be it through the hardships of people experienced last year or be it the war. We saw liberal vultures using this nation's misfortune turn to their fortune. A best recent example is during the Aragalia season, we saw several YouTubers coming to the foray to make a profit by portraying themselves as heroes of the poor. Some university kids came to the forefront to take the necessary pictures of them at the protest so that they could show them to their uh, recruiting universities under the title activists. Where are they now? Have they got their visa or have the students got their preferred universities? Now, back in 2006, when the internet in this country was in its infancy, online keyboard heroes were at a minimum. The go-to tool of the trade in those days was blogging. So, within the Colombo liberal media circles, just like now, it was mentioning the name Rajapaksas that got the cloud needed, and at that time, President Mahindra Rajapaksa. This is when we saw a young, budding writer coming to the foray. Writer Sanjana Hathfatua was not a stranger to that circle, where, whereas his ground views blogging side began a quest to fight against the mighty Rajpaksa's regime. Or at least that's what he said in a recent interview. This garnered Sanjana much recognition. The liberals praised him, saw him as a hero of the oppressed, celebrated him at local coffee shops and uplifted him at local gatherings. As the popularity of ground views went up, so did Sanchana, began expanding his horizons from a mere blogger to a keyboard crusader. If the Rajabaksas did something wrong, in comes Sanjana and his keyboard brigade to expose how things are not the way they are. With the popularity rising, Sanjana managed to get his PhD, became a special advisor to non-governmental foundations in Switzerland, and now has managed his way way down under to the land of the Kiwis in New Zealand. Why am I telling you all this? It's purely to show you the hypocrisy of these individuals who use our pain to make a gain for themselves. So what is Sanjana doing in New Zealand these days? Perhaps furthering freedom of speech efforts? Perhaps championing, championing uh, citizen journalism to a greater extent? Now, he's not just Sanjana, he's Dr. Sanjana. Sadly, that is not the case. A recent short documentary released by a New Zealand citizen journalistic website called Operation People found that Sanjana is no longer a crusader for freedom of expression, but more so another governmental tool to censor journalists in New Zealand. In Sri Lanka, fighting against the Rajapaksas and the media oppression, and in New Zealand, supporting the government to suppress journalists. He is part of what is called the Disinformation Project that pushes to censor New Zealand journalists who are not in line with the government propaganda message. Watch. From Sanjana's position as a citizen journalist and social media activist, Sanjana argues that a lack of information, the void left by what mainstream media will not cover, builds an information landscape of myth and fiction. And it is this landscape of myth and fiction that the government uses as its operating principle. I think information fuels discussion and debate. I think without information, what often happens is that myth and fiction takes over. Fiction is great as a genre that you can buy off a bookshelf. It becomes very dangerous when 
it becomes the operating principle for governments and uh, uh, governments to uh, base policies on. This myth and fiction generated by the lack of information, Sanjana argues, forms the bedrock for violent conflict. Uh, the lack of information, I think, is the bedrock for violent conflict, to be very honest with you. In contrast, we have seen the New Zealand version of Sanjana Hatatua, this time working closely with the New Zealand government to set their and propagate that narrative on government-funded mainstream media. This is quite the contrast, and it is difficult to reconcile why someone who was so passionate about countering the mainstream narratives would become the very one who was setting the mainstream narratives and contributing to the censoring of citizen journalism in New Zealand. It is difficult to understand why he would contribute to creating a void in the information landscape, a void he said would lead to myth and fiction, a type of fiction that Sanjana suggested would be used as the operating principles of government. And that's dangerous, according to Sanjana Hatatua. We open with Sanjana's rhetorical question about Gotabaya Rajapaksa. What does it mean for Sri Lanka's democracy to have this two-faced individual as president? I can't help but imagine that there is an element of projection in that question. Well, that was the short documentary produced by Operation People. Joining me now all the way from New Zealand are the makers of that short documentary, Chantal Baker and Phil Shaw. Operation People is an investigative online hub whose goal is to focus on stories and perspectives of real people without the influence of government funding. They both join me uh, via Zoom from Christchurch. Thank you very much, guys, uh, for your time. Um, first of all, Chantal, let me ask you, what was the reason that you wanted to look into Sanjana Hathoto? Thank you so much for having us on, Mahesh. The reason we wanted to look into Sanjana Hathoto was because here in New Zealand, he's actually worked for a, an agency called the Disinformation Project. They have at times been funded directly from our Prime Minister's office, and they have worked to censor voices such as myself and our company through their research. They claim that many things that in anything, any work we do, most of the work that we do that goes against the government narrative, they claim is disinformation. And so we found it very interesting when we began to look into him that he actually started at a, as a citizen journalist while here in New Zealand, he's looking to censor them. So that's why we really wanted to investigate more about who he is and why is it that our mainstream media has him on as an expert in information and uses his research to silence opposing voices. Absolutely. I feel, um, if you may, is there anything else that you discovered during this uh, time when you were looking into Sanjana? Yeah, well, Mahesh, um, I understand that you guys have sort of uh, done your research on Sanjana Hatatura as well. And and I guess our, our research with the Disinformation Project here in New Zealand uh, led us down sort of a, a, a track where uh, we discovered sort of a different Sanjana over in, in Sri Lanka. Um, and it, it was really quite different to this Sanjana here in New Zealand and, and that we sort of tried to portray in, in the documentary. And I, and I guess the, the point there was that while he was in Sri Lanka, he was very much a citizen journalist and, and would probably be very much aligned with us here at Operation People where we're, you know, trying to give another perspective, trying to uh, give a perspective that isn't funded by government media or have that sort of influence. And and a lot of what he what he said with his citizen journalism with ground views, I, I very much align with myself, and I think he uh, spoke very well in the video that we used. Um, and, and I guess what was concerning it and why I sort of dug into Sanjana uh, in the New Zealand version was it's quite the opposite to what he was saying in that video. He yes, he features on mainstream media, and, I, and I'm not too concerned with that. He he's fully entitled to do that. Um, but what, what was really interesting was the fact that he would uh, jump onto, or, or he's in this disinformation project, which is itself a, a sort of censoring organisation. Well, and it has it has that capacity, and we've, we've found recent documents, um, government documents recently, uh, in, in the fact, uh, a report that the disinformation project produced, which has a heading that indicates that they're involved with censorship. 
Uh, un unfortunately, the paragraph under the heading is redacted, so we don't get to see exactly what capacity uh, the disinformation project do have in censorship. However, they are they're definitely setting a narrative uh, which is enabling the government to then perform the functions of, of censorship with other departments. So he's he's really done sort of an about turn uh, on on his his role of sort of free speech and and uh, you know and free speech and democracy. Absolutely, um, guys. As you know, um, Sri Lanka is currently going through a massive economic crisis, and just like. During war times, we see there are very liberal oriented individuals presenting themselves as problem solvers uh, only to capitalize on the misery of this nation. Why do you think they do this to gain a better life for themselves elsewhere in the world? Or like Sanjana seems to be a prime example of this. A common, is this a common sight in New Zealand? Yeah, well, Mahesha, that, that's another interesting question in that, yes, I, I think there is a trend of, of sort of these these more liberal oriented uh sort of and a lot of times they're, they're academics um and now these liberal oriented academics that uh do form these more uh global or transnational ngos and organizations and they do travel around a wee bit um and sanjan is a prime example there so he's he's involved with multiple projects in sri lanka as you probably know with ict for peace and um there's there's a few other organizations as well and you know and then he's come over and, and studied here and now he's involved in an organization here as well and and our research shows that that group is is very much uh has its sort of origins in uh well or well not not the group per se but definitely individuals in that group um actually profess to uh, identify as marxists and things like that so they they definitely have that sort of left-leaning um element now i do think that groups right across the political spectrum do capitalize on on uh issues and um i guess that's just the nature of communication these days and the access to information we we're sort of connected globally right right around the world and, and so i think yes it seems to be a big trend on the sort of very uh, left sort of collectivist side of the political spectrum. But I think it is a trend that we see right across the political spectrum as well. Uh, finally, uh, do you all think that New Zealanders would be interested in finding out more about this? Or just like in Sri Lanka, are they too completely conned by these types of individuals who might not see the truth until it's too late, how it happens here? New Zealanders are really inquisitive and they want to learn more and they're always searching for more information. And so with our page and with my channel, it grew rapidly, particularly when I was live streaming a protest we had against vaccine mandates in early of 2022. So my page took off. We had hundreds of thousands to millions of views um, consistently throughout that time. Then we found the government document that showed that they actually had requested pages of mine to be taken down. So the government's actively trying to censor voices and I think whenever that happens, people start to try and find the truth themselves and citizen journalists and reporters such as myself find that our platforms grow even more. So regardless of how many pages they try to take down, we just start new ones and they keep growing every single day because people are searching for what they believe is the truth. They want to hear different voices and different opinions. So I believe New Zealanders will really want to hear more about Sanjana and any information that you can give us to help us with our investigations would be really, really wonderful. Wonderful. Indeed, um, it makes a lot of sense and, and really appreciative of the fact that you all took the time to dive into this. Uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was Chantel Baker and Phil Shaw from Operation People New Zealand. Let's take a short commercial break. I'll be right back with the close.
Everything these days is not what it seems. Those days, if we saw an apple, we definitely knew it was an apple. Nothing to discuss. It looks like an apple, smells like an apple, tastes like an apple, and of course, it's bloody well is an apple. But nowadays, we are told that the apple, in fact, identifies as an orange. As ludicrous as it sounds, this woke BS is slowly creeping into our conversations in Sri Lanka day by day. If you don't buy into that BS, we've been told that we are backward and not part of the progressive world. Humor me. If inventing delusional facts to satisfy your sorry life is considered progressive, then by all means, let me be backward as much as I can. In America today, you can see the whole trans drama. Children with no decision-making abilities are being told by perverted men on the internet that they can do whatever they want and not listen to their elders. By that, those perverted men can create an environment in where their disgusting activities can thrive on. As shown to you earlier in this program, people who start with good intentions later on change those intentions to satisfy their need and hunger to be what they really want to be, thus exposing their real agenda. It's never about fighting for freedom of speech or exposing the corrupt. Later, we found out that it was a mere gimmick to get citizenship and a doctorate in a foreign land. Have you noticed that every time it's later that we find out the real intentions of these people? Later, we found out that leaders who claim to be nationalistic changed their tune and sacrificed the betterment of 22 million people when their own children were abroad and were afraid that their actions here might create an ugly world for them there. Later, we found out that protests, uh, protesters who came to teach us a new way of govern governance didn't do jack shit. They just paved the way for an elderly man whose lifelong dream was to lead this nation. It's always later that we find that out. Should we as a nation strive to identify that before and not wait till later when everything becomes too late for you and me? On a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. Do check us out, the State of the Nation podcast, available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify. I'm Mahish Johnny. From all of us at Other Than 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you again on Tuesday on Get Real. Goodbye.